Sound Ketchum, and I was born country. Hey everybody, welcome to the Born Country Podcast, where we take a look back at the great country music of the 90s with the artists who were there and the artists of today in which it inspired. I'm your host, Arthur Bourne, and this is episode number 24. This week on the show, we have a quick chat with 90s hit maker Hal Ketchum. Before we jump into the call with Hal, I'd like to invite everyone to join the Born Country Podcast family in a group on Facebook. To join, visit facebook.com slash groups slash Born Country Family. Now, enjoy this week's episode with Hal Ketchum. This week, I'm joined by the man behind the hit Small Town Saturday Night, Past the Point of Rescue, Sure Love, Hearts Are Gonna Roll, Hal Ketchum. Welcome to the Born Country Podcast. How you doing? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Hal, uh, we might as well start right at the beginning, because you have a pretty interesting path from childhood to country music stardom. Uh, there, there aren't a whole lot of country artists who were born in New York State. At my research, I came up upon yourself, uh, Jerry Duff Walker, Eddie Rabbit, and a small handful of others. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me? <laughs> can you tell me about what kind of music you grew up uh, listening to in New York before you moved to Texas? I played uh, in a band uh, called Dean Modal and the Oriental Cha Chas. That was pretty <laughs> much it. And and I, we did cover tunes, you know, and we just can kind of cut our teeth on this stuff. So, uh, and I was a drummer. Okay. Too, you know. Uh, what so kind of- I was I played a place called Bernie's, uh, and uh, first rule of thumb was uh, if you played a Rolling Stones song, uh, a fight would break out. Okay, so that was pretty much it. <laughs> well, eventually you'd find yourself moving down to Texas, which is quite a haul from New York. Did did you make the move with intentions of pursuing music, or was it just a change of scenery that you were looking for? Uh, I was I was uh, I, I played uh, in a in a in a band uh, and uh, I was a drummer, you know, and that that, that kind of just it just kind of panned out, you know. Yeah. The the harder you work, the luckier you get, I guess. You know, <laughs> so that's that's pretty much it. You know, and it was just wonderful. It was really uh, an evolution, really. You know. So it was all good. Cool. Well, in reading your bio, it seems that um, it wasn't long after relocating that you discovered a legendary dance hall. Can you briefly tell yeah. uh, the Board Country listeners about the importance of Green Hall to country music and which artists were making their names there? Uh, Green Hall was just a, uh, it was a band gig. It was a great, great opportunity. Uh, we got in front of a lot of people. Uh, and it was just, uh, you know, it was the evolution of, of country music, really. Absolutely. And you were running around with uh, what uh, Lyle Lovett, Jerry Jeff Walker, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I toured with Jerry Jeff, uh, and, yeah. and and we we had a a pilot named Captain Lane Bybee, whose motto was eight hours from the bottle to the throttle." <laughs> so uh, it was a pretty fascinating time. It sounds like it. Uh, we don't get to talk about yeah. uh, Jerry Duff Walker very often on the on the podcast here. Do you have any stories or memories that you can share about touring with him? Uh, I, I got I got real drunk on tequila one night, and uh, and he kind of he he wrangled me home and <laughs> uh, got me got me back safe. So, uh, but but yeah, I toured with Jerry Jeff for years. A terrific guy, really, really a, a kind, kind, sweet guy. Well, after finding your place in the Texas country music scene, uh, you wrote and self-recorded your first album, which in turn would eventually catch the ear of Curb Records. I know that it's quite a time gap. Can you kind of take us through uh, what your experience was like between recording your own album and eventually signing the deal and moving to Nashville? Uh, I, I, I kind of did, you know, I, I, I worked, uh, we, I, I put in uh, skylights for, uh, Jim McGuire, who was a dear, dear friend of mine and a wonderful guy. And, uh, it just kind of evolved from there, really. 
1991, Curb Records released your debut major uh, label album, Past the Point of Rescue. This is easily Absolutely. easily one of the great country albums of the early 90s, and I don't Thank necessarily want to. I don't. I want to get too deep into the album on this show this week because I'd love to have you back on again to specifically talk about that record. But oh, great! Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a number one record. I I, I had just such a good fortune, you know, terrific uh, experience for me, and I and I got to travel in Norway. I got to travel in in Dublin and. Uh, Belfast and all the above, you know, so it was, it's been a real wonderful ticket. Yeah. Well, truly. I, I absolutely do want to talk briefly about small town Saturday night because I absolutely love this song. It was huge throughout my childhood in the nineties. I, I McGuire and I, uh, did a, did a video for this song and, uh, and it just went, uh, went through the roof. It really did. It just was terrific. Absolutely terrific. So it was a good, good fortune for me, absolutely. And you did mention the music video, which is also one of my favorite videos of all time. Uh, can you tell us a little more <laughs> about Jim? Uh, this seems like a name that's probably not very familiar to a lot of our listeners. He directed the music video. Uh, can you talk Maguire, about- yeah, Maguire is a dear, dear friend of mine, and uh, we we did it uh, we did it on the hoof, you know, basically, and uh, it just it went it went uh, it went viral from there. You know, so it's just terrific. Well, past the point of rescue and the follow-up record, Sure Love and Every Little Word, uh, led to your becoming an official member of, of the Grand Ole Opry in 1994, a membership that will be Truly. reaching 25 years in 2019. Uh, what, That's fantastic. What does the Opry mean to you and your career, Hal? Uh, it means uh, the, the best friends that I've ever known. Uh uh, truly uh, accomplished musicians. Uh, Whisper and Bill is a dear friend of mine, and and uh, he's a, just a terrific guy, you know. And and he's lived uh, longer than anyone <laughs> and on the, on the planet. And, uh, and he's just a terrific guy. He really is. Well, I've had the opportunity to be backstage during an Opry show, and it's so cool to see how everyone's so friendly and all come together to make each night something special for the fans. Truly, absolutely true. And, you know, Vince Gill's a dear friend of mine, too, and uh, he's a wonderful guy. And he's, he plays in a band called the Time Jumpers. Yes. Uh, and he's a t- just a terrific artist and a great guy and a dear friend. So it's all been good, man. Well, come- it's been a long, long, strange trip, but it's <laughs> been uh, wonderful. Well, coming in on 25 years as a member of the Opry, do you have one or two specific favorite memories that you can share with us? Uh, I, I opened for Delbert McClinton one time, and uh, I said, uh, Mr. McClinton, do you have any advice for a young songwriter? And he said, uh, yeah, never leave your wallet in the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's terrific. Wonderful. Yeah, and we, you know, he was, a, he was a piece of work, I tell you what. And a blue singing son of a gun. Yeah, I tell you yeah. what, man. Uh, through 2008's release of your album Father Time, you had a long-running relationship with Curb Records, and it's pretty unheard of for an artist to stay with one label for the better part of two decades. After splitting with Curb, I understand that you were ready to pack up and leave Nashville, returning home to Texas. At this point, did you initially yeah. just need a break in your mind, or are you done with music and moving on? No, no, no. I was, I was really cool. I, I was, okay. I was very happy, and I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis for years, and uh, you know, my dad used to say, "You can't kill a dumbass." So it's, uh, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> It seems that after a few years of escape, uh, new song ideas started popping up. At what point do you start writing again? And then when do you realize that you're ready to make a new record, which eventually would come uh, on the Troubadour? Uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, that was a, a, and I dreamt that record. I dreamt it. I, you know, I was, I was in a deep REM sleep and, uh, and I just started jotting stuff down. You know, I, I, I always keep a pad and paper by the bed and uh and just get with it you know yeah on the troubadour yeah. it tones back on the country quite a bit and leans more towards a folksy soulful sound 
I want to ask, despite the yeah. commercial success of your early records and everything in between, is this the most personal, uh, most How Catch em album of your career? Absolutely. Absolutely true. It's been four years now since the release of On the Troubadour. Uh, before we wind down, Hal, please tell me you have something else in the works. Uh, I do, actually. You know, I, I just wrote a song. Uh, it's called A Polka Day. It goes, uh, oh, the neighbors are rising. I can hear them down below. Coffee brewing paper in the yard. Work, work, workaholics chasing that old dream. I guess somebody had, has to work that hard. Me, I'd rather wake up with my honey close at hand. I'd rather love the morning hours away. Because I don't want to rule the world. I don't want to be king. All I really want is a polka day. Wonderful. Can't wait to hear it, man. Thank you, brother. You know, Hal, uh, before we wrap up, I've got a couple fan submitted questions. Uh, Brandon in Arizona asks, uh, will Hal's song Take It Out On Me ever see the light of day? Uh, I don't think so. I really don't. Uh, it, it, it's a, it, it's a, it's a lovely song. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna see the light of day. Um, I've just got too much irons in the fire right now. And in Washington says meeting Howell is so heartwarming. It's one of my favorite memories. Please ask how, what his earliest childhood memory is in the fourth grade. My high school sweetheart was Jerry B Bain. And, uh, and I, I got cute with her and I punched her in the nose. <laughs> you right. can't kill a dumbass, apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. This one, this one is fun. Uh, Raymond in Ohio wants to know, how did Hal's appearance in the 1994 film Maverick come to be? And what was that experience like? Oh, that was great. It was wonderful. I, I, you know, Danny Glover and I, uh, were uh bank robbers right and uh it was just fantastic it really was and and danny lover's a dear friend of mine finally tracy in indiana asks how at one point there was a note on your website that mentioned that you had been writing your memoirs is a book still in the works uh i i think so i think so um I, again i'm you know i'm uh I'm not I'm not a very a very prolific writer, but but I do I do get flashes once in a while. So hopefully that'll pan out. Well, I know everybody excited to read that. All right, folks, make sure oh, to check you. out howcatchem dot com. Like Hal on Facebook. Check out the tour dates. Hal, is there anything else that you'd like to say or plug before we wrap this oh, up? Oh no, no, it's just been just been an absolute pleasure, brother. Thank you so right. much. Hal, thank you so much for taking the time to call us up on the show today. Adios. Thanks again to Hal Ketchum and his wife, Andrea, for taking the time to hang out with us for a little bit this week. Next up on the Born Country Podcast, I believe that we have Joe Nichols lined up for episode number 25 and the great singer-songwriter Paul Overstreet joining in for episode number 26. As always, things can change, but that's the plan at this point. We will begin wrapping up the first season of the Born Country Podcast at episode number 30. Then I'll take a little break, start making some new videos for the website, and planning for season two of the podcast. So, again, make sure to join the Born Country Podcast family group on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash Born Country Family. That way, we'll be able to keep you updated on future videos, future interviews, and more. And while you're in the group, you'll be able to share uh, photos, videos, memories of your favorite country music stars. Also, thank you to all of those who have bought Born Country Podcast t-shirts at Tee Public. If you'd like to get your own Born Country t-shirt, we have a number of different designs available with more on the way. To check out the store, visit IWasBornCountry.com and on the main page, scroll down until you see the shop section and click your way right to the store. Your t-shirt purchases are a huge help to keeping Born Country alive. That wraps it up for me this week. Join me back here in two weeks when we get to chat with Joe Nichols about his Never Gets Old Classic Country project, his first album released way back in 1996, and his run of incredible hits throughout the 2000s. Until then, for IWasBornCountry.com and the Born Country Podcast, my name is Arthur Bourne, and I was born country. Take care.